This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Omaha. Okay, we're back. We're live. It's the four o'clock rock. A little bit after four, but that's okay. You know, it's you know, good enough. <laughs> here on Think Tech, and of course, this is our flagship energy show. Hawaii, the state of clean energy, having a lot to do with the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. And if you guys did not know, I'm going to tell you now that we're having our clean energy celebration and program, really important program about transportation, about clean energy and transportation on what? August October 28th. You're August right. 28th. August 28th. Yes. Or, yes. August 28th. It's this month. Coming up. Yeah, it's coming up in like three weeks. Yeah. You know, it's coming happening yeah. soon. And where is it exa exactly, Maria? At the YWCA on Richard Street. I knew you'd say that. Yeah. yeah. It's all day. Yes, it is. And how do you sign up exactly? You go to the website. Yeah, which is hawaiienergypolicy.hawaii.edu. Hawaii yes, you sir. Right? Okay. The gallery is, is, is saying yes, the gallery, including Sharon Moriwaki, our principal co-host. <laughs> and that, that voice was Maria Tome. She's our co-host for this part of the show anyway, <laughs> this month anyway, for sure. And P.S., uh, she's going to do a show on transportation starting in uh, a week or two? Yeah, October. October. September, September and October. September and October. Yeah. We appreciate that. It's pinch hitting. Yeah, pinch hitting uh, for, yes. uh, for Tim. It's every uh, other week, yes. Uh, uh, Ap Apicella. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so today's show um, is about the Sustainable Transportation Coalition. We're going to find out all about that from Shem Lawler of Blue Planet Foundation. Hi, Shem. Jen, how's it going? Nice, yeah. And uh, <laughs> and we have a, a little a little a little movie in advance from Lily Koo, who sits to my left. Hi, Lily. Hi. Hi, Jake. <laughs> all yours, Lily. Let's see the movie. Tell us about it. Well. Um, this is about military sector. Is the military ho ohana is actually a very important part of our uh, of the island's community. So Hawaii Energy is really glad to be able to help support the energy side, energy needs, uh, especially on the efficiency side. So um, you can take a look at the this small video is about the world class uh, wastewater plant at Scofield Barrack. Because all things are related to energy, right? Yes. And Hawaii Energy is looking for efficiency everywhere. Yes, everywhere. Good for you guys. So I'm, I'm glad that I'm, you know, with my job, it takes me to everywhere, including the most interesting part of the facility. Yeah, you're a happy camper, aren't you? Yes. Okay, tell, tell, so let's, let's play the movie now, and, and then we'll have commentary from, from our group later. Let's take a look. Watch this. Nestled in the plush, fertile lands of central Oahu's Lelehu Plain, rests a critically important facility to the United States Army's 24-7 operations in the area. This is the Schofield Barracks Wastewater Treatment Plant at Wheeler Army Airfield. This plant is an A+. This is actually the, the most complicated and highest quality plant. It's not the largest plant, but 100% of our effluent is reused. It's reused on food crops. We um, save millions of gallons a day of water from being pumped up from our aquifer, fresh potable water, and we take water that would typically be dumped into the ocean. We clean that water to the highest quality standards, use that on food crops, which reduces the amount of water we draw from the aquifer. After being contracted by the U.S. Army in 2004, Aqua Engineers has undertaken the task of installing numerous upgrades to the wastewater treatment system, in teaming up with Aqua Engineers, Hawaii Energy helped fund an energy study to identify energy savings opportunities. Based on that study, Aqua Engineers moved forward on the recommendations. Hawaii Energy provided financial incentives to replace older model motors with updated energy efficiency ones and removed obsolete transformers that have since made room for much needed workspace for on-site scientists and researchers. In all, the wastewater treatment system has realized an energy savings of close to 1 million kilowatt hours, equivalent to an annual savings of $158,000. And without, uh, without the energy savings, without the support of Hawaii Energy, we wouldn't have uh, been able to, uh, to pay for those or to pay for the extra effort required, the extra engineering that it takes to, to go the extra mile. Okay, we're back, we're live, and 
That was a very interesting movie. It was so vivid, you could almost smell it. <laughs> and the smell, as, uh, as Marvin said, was, oh boy, <laughs> special. And you were there, that was you. Yes, yes. Yeah, tell us about it. Um, well, I think wastewater is um, uh, one of the, t uh, you know, one of the uh, plants that you can do a lot of different things on it because it has all different components. And uh, with Hawaii Energy's help, we have given them 140,000 worth of rebates uh, and, and for them to save uh, almost a million kWh and with the annual saving of, of a quarter of a uh, million dollars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, not just on the wastewater side, uh, they have all different types of technology that is going on in the military uh, sector. And it's a very unique sector because it actually has um, you know, the uh, housing, warehouse, business, small business, and uh, offices. So uh, it has all different type of energy signatures. So um, we also uh, help, uh, you know, the military side to, uh, you know, conduct, uh, to go ahead and conduct like energy studies. And also uh, recently they have hired like performance contractors to find out all the energy conservation measures. And they are already planning to do 97 buildings on their lighting retrofits, all the low hanging fruits. Um, they, on the uh, barrack side, um, they are installing uh, the occupancy based uh, air conditioning energy management system uh, so that you know the soldiers can live in comfort um, and also safe energy at the same time so and also there are like building uh, envelope putting installations um, and a lot of simple stuff like uh, uh, putting aerators and things like that so they are very busy, and Hawaii Energy is really glad to be able to yeah. give them some more money. Yeah, oh, that's great. No, because uh, you know we can learn a lot from them. They can learn about us too, um, but they they have the deep pocket to do some of this research and uh, testing, and we should be there with them. Yes. And you are good for you. Uh, and I sense there's another movie coming here soon about the military. Am I right? Yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> and the interesting part is the military makes up uh, sixteen percent of the uh, overall electricity load here in uh, here on Oahu so mm -hmm. um, more so you know they would like to save money along the way since you're there so using so much electricity and they may as well save something at the same time right to in order to reinvest back sure. to their sure you want to stay close with them good yes. glad you did that glad you did the movie looking for the next one hopefully in the yes. next week or two you'll be back right yes definitely okay thank you Lily Koo of thank Hawaii you. Energy you know, energy and water are related, and, and, and water and life are related. We have to make sure we preserve our water supply and be efficient about it. Good for you guys. We'll take a short break. This is Hawaii, the state of clean energy. We have Shem Lawler of uh, Blue Planet Foundation. We have Maria Tomei, our co-host. And we're going to say farewell to Lily Koo and introduce our next co-host, which is Sharon Moriwaki, right after this break. You'll see. We'll be back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, which streams live on thinktechhawaii.com, uploads to YouTube, and broadcasts on cable OC16 and Alelo 54. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Living in this crazy world, so far up in the confusion, nothing is making sense. Freedom. Is it a feeling? Is it a place? Is it an idea? At Dive Heart, we believe freedom is all of these and more, regardless of your ability. Dive Heart wants to help you escape the bonds of this world and defy gravity. Since 2001, Dive Heart has helped children, adults, and veterans of all abilities go where they have never gone before. Dive Heart has helped them transition to their new normal. Search DiveHeart.org and share our mission with others, and in the process, help people of all abilities imagine the possibilities in their Okay, I told you, I told you we'd be back, and yes, we are back. We yeah. shall return, we have returned. This is Sharon Moriwaki. 
She's a co-chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. She's a co-host of our show. Wow. <coughs> and she's the one, you know, putting together that big program on um, August. August. August 28th, August. Yeah. yeah. August. Which is what day of the week exactly? <laughs> Monday. Monday. Monday, okay. And where Monday. is it exactly? It will be at the Y, YWCA. Okay, and what does hawaiienergypolicy.hawaii.edu have to do with it? That's where you register. That's where you see the program. Shem's going to be on the program. Maria's going to be oh on the program. You're going to be oh on the program. Boy. Oh, okay. boy. Well, in for it <laughs> now. <laughs> uh, it's good nature, good cheer, good information, good uh -huh. thoughts, good conclusions, good recommendations for action. It'll in be the state for action. Yeah. Right. Okay, so today we're going to talk about <clears throat> what is the Sustainable Transportation Coalition of Hawaii? Um, it seems like an easy question, but it's not. <laughs> okay, let's let Shem go first. What is it? So, uh, it is uh, affectionately known as STITCH, Sustainable Transportation <laughs> Coalition of Hawaii, STITCH. Great, great. Um, we are a, uh, it is a program that is administered by Blue Planet Foundation. So, Blue Planet Foundation staff actually administer the program, but it really is a coalition of stakeholders that are interested in uh, advancing clean transportation in Hawaii. The coalition is one of about 90 to 100 uh, coalitions nationally that are part of the U.S. Department of Energy's Clean uh, Cities program. Uh, Stitch formerly was known as Honolulu Clean Cities and was uh, kind of administered through a partnership between the city and county of Honolulu and the state energy office mm -hmm. prior to 2014 when Blue Planet Foundation took over the program. So you are the sole operators of the of the coalition. Then. Cor correct. You're, you're running it. That we, we run it. There is an advisory board of directors uh, that's made up of some of the stakeholders that uh, takes uh, votes on uh, strategic direction and on policy questions. Um, but as far as the day to day programming stuff, it is Blue Planet Foundation staff. Okay, let's get personal. <laughs> Who's in the coalition? So. Uh, as I mentioned, it used to be called Honolulu Clean Cities, and we went through about a year and a half process of rebranding it for a couple of reasons. The first one was we had been operating statewide for a number of years, and so the Honolulu uh, name didn't really fit anymore. And the other thing was a lot of people got confused about what we did because mm -hmm. Clean Cities didn't really uh, shout out transportation, so we wanted to find a name that, that told people what we actually do. Yeah, there's nothing that defines transportation as much as the word transportation. <laughs> right, exactly. You can quote me on this. <laughs> so, uh, but because of that rebranding process, we really kind of put um, building the coalition on the back burner for a couple of years. And so just last month, or actually in June, we launched our, our campaign for 2017 actually built to get official stakeholders to sign. Uh, right now, we have gotten HART, uh, Ulupono Initiative, uh, Bike Share Hawaii, Sash Biki, uh, BMW of Hawaii, uh, Cutter, yeah. Ford, Chevy, uh -huh. um, and we were in talks with a number, also Lyft, uh, and we were in talks what with... What happened to Uber? <laughs> Uber, <laughs> they, they didn't reach out to us yet. So, but we, uh, we, these take meetings, and so we're, we've had a number of meetings with probably about 30 different organizations about uh -huh. joining the coalition. Uh -huh. We expect by, over the next two to three months to have about 40 to 50 What, uh, what does a coalition member have to do? So essentially what joining the coalition means, uh, we, Stitch has an adopted vision. And our vision is a, a future Hawaii where um, essentially the automobile plays a much uh, lesser role, that there's more transportation alternatives that are better quality, and that uh, all the vehicles that do remain on the road are run by non-fossil fuel energy sources. So essentially what we're asking of stakeholders is if you agree with that general vision, and you want to be part of helping to make that happen, join the coalition. But coalition stakeholders are not, are not committing to any firm deadlines or benchmarks or, or necessarily agreeing with any, every policy or program that's stitched How does. about contributions? Are they agreeing to any defined contributions? So we do have three different <laughs> stakeholder levels. We have supporter, advocate, and champion. So anybody can join as a supporter for no fee, but we do have for non-public agencies. This is so members now. Right. Uh, but that's members of the coalition, so that's what we're talking about. Right, now. but there is a fee for the advocate and champion levels, yes. Okay, big fee. It's not you a big fee. That's not a big fee. So it depends on what you are. You might get more. So if you're a for-profit <laughs> business, it's, uh, I think, $250 for advocate, $1,000 for oh. champion level. And that's pretty so reasonable. It's pretty reasonable. Is that, individual. is that an annual? Is that an annual? It is annual, but you don't get kicked out of the coalition if you, after 12 months, you just go back to supporter. Oh, okay. That's good. Yeah. So, um, but you know, uh, you know, it, it could be a talk fest. 
What is it beyond a talk fest? So I think what you're asking is what do we actually do, right? So we work on three fronts, uh, policy advocacy, education and outreach, and then we look for opportunities to actually implement um, um, programs or um, uh, activities that would actually implement clean transportation. So on the advocacy side, we do a lot of legislative stuff, uh, both through the Blue Planet side and through the Stitch side. Uh, education and outreach, we do, we've been having a number of um, electric vehicle rider events. I think we've done close to 12 or 15 mm -hmm. over the last 18 what months. What kind of events? Electric vehicle ride and drive. Right. Oh, okay. So we coordinate all, uh, a number of car dealerships to bring uh, EV models to a specific location. Mm -hmm. We, we so get insurance for the venue. We do outreach and get people to come and actually test drive so the vehicles. Oh, okay. So it's a test drive. Yep. Everybody meets mm -hmm. the same. You know, I was thinking for a minute about these old Model T kind of organizations that right. would drive halfway across the country and they would, you know, take their family with them and stop here and stop there and everybody would talk about their vehicles on the right. the guy who well, does it. Uh, actually, that would be cool to I do I want to tell you about an event we have coming up. So our yeah. big event uh, on September 17th, it's a Sunday morning, uh, we're doing our second annual Electric Island Drive. Mm. Uh -huh. oh, so yeah, we are getting, that. yeah, mm. we're getting, uh, we ex last year we had about 55 vehicles participate and we had about 100 people. Um, the the vehicles um, meet at specified locations around town and then drive through Honolulu, through Waikiki, and then terminate at KCC. Uh, last year we had a little celebration just for the participants. This year we're doing much bigger. We expect about 200 vehicles to actually participate in the drive itself. And then we're having an EV fair at KCC mm -hmm. after the event. And we're expecting two to 3,000 people from the public to come. We're going to have dealerships there with uh, mm. electric vehicles. We're going to have food trucks. We're going to have live music. It's and people can, can actually ride uh, drive the cars? Not, not at the event because of the how crowded yeah, we expect the parking lot to be. Uh, but we do, <laughs> we do do ride drive <laughs> events quite frequently. We're doing one on, the, on September 9th on the Big Island. We're going to do one on October 4th mm. at uh, UH Manoa. So we send those uh, events out to our, our newsletter list and, and our, our social media followers about regularly. You sound like you're in launch mode. We, we launching are launching into these mode. various events. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right now, mm -hmm. yeah. I hope you'll mention them when you appear um, on uh, August 28th. August 28th. Um, and, we, and, and we will have the Tesla models there um, and, and possibly, possibly uh, the uh, Mirai, the mm. hydrogen mm. vehicle. Yeah. So. Mm be part of your event as well <laughs> moving forward yeah. yeah well the events are obviously they're intended to raise interest about electric vehicles make people more comfortable that Correct. there are others maybe in their community their peer group who are willing to do electric vehicles okay. so um, um, you know looking at the mission itself as you defined it a minute ago uh, I guess it's primary primarily around putting electric vehicles instead of fossil vehicles on the highway because no. that's what is it, okay, I wanted you to no. disagree okay. with me. Right. So <laughs> I wanted you to disagree, and sure enough, and he sure said, he right. is. So right. what else is there? Um, there are a lot of people that they look at clean transportation in their mind when they visualize that they picture just EVs. Uh, there are really three pathways to reducing our energy footprint in, in transportation. The first one is reducing travel demand. Right. I think to some extent. That's like efficiency. Exactly. It is. Mm -hmm. I think to some extent the, the amount of travel that people have to do kind of shows the amount of dysfunction in our land use, right? If you have to go a lot of places and very far, that shows we didn't do a very good job of putting people close to services, mm. right? We didn't build um, complete mm -hmm. communities, right? So a lot of that is land use. Uh, the second thing, reducing travel is for number one. Second thing is the travel that is done, let's move it to the most efficient modes of transportation, right? So by far walking and biking are the most energy efficient. So we want to build communities where walking and biking is uh, safe and enjoyable, even pleasurable. And then thirdly, uh, we want to make sure that the energy used for the vehicles that are on the road comes from clean sources, right? So we are really kind of focused on all three of those. We want people to take transit more. We want to convert our transit vehicles to electric, uh, electricity, right? We want to um, encourage people to walk and bike as much as possible. Uh, we want to encourage modes of transportation that actually facilitate a car-free or car li lifestyle, like bike share, like car sharing, like even the Uber and Lyft services. Because mm -hmm. yeah. even if you don't have a car, occasionally you do need yeah. an automobile to run errands or go grocery shopping, right? So, but then, you know, we really need a, a higher quality transit um, system that can kind of support all of that, uh, including the walking and biking. We have a transit system on Oahu that's been 
at capacity since 1983, really. So we really need a major upgrade there. Uh, and then, obviously, there's a lot of work to be done on the electric uh, vehicle side, and, and even hydrogen vehicles and biofuels and those things. So we have our hands in a lot of pots, um, and we push where there's opportunity, where there's events, and where there's funding, and those kind of things. That's the most ambitious plan I ever heard of. <laughs> You're, you're talking about remaking our entire society. Well, the society remakes itself regularly. So we want to make sure that we get in the way and we, and we kind of funnel the, the next iteration of change <laughs> into, into, the, into the right pathway. Boy. Well, you know, project. about five or six years ago, we, the Energy Policy Forum did a survey, and about 50% of the people said that they would not travel with public transportation no way nothing you could do and we just did a survey and we're seeing that that needle has moved that more people are willing to ride the bus mm -hmm. public transportation as well as other modes um, so so it is shifting you know right and, it is yeah. but i think we it, even if we have more people that are willing we don't have any spare capacity in the bus and that's the that's the fundamental problem yeah well I'm, you know a comment just a digressionary comment is that when Blue Planet first started doing its foundation things, uh, it was talking about uh, showing people that it would be better to pull or put a, a, a different kind of bowl right. um, and uh, do efficiency at home and sort of you know the basic steps of moving to public awareness about clean energy. But this is this is w well further than that. Right. This is real serious now. It, it, it involves more than just the use of energy. <laughs> it involves everything. Right. You know, and I, I think of all the things you're talking about, and that would be a, a better place to live. Right. Um, you know, forget about energy; it's about life. Right. <laughs> it's everything. <laughs> okay, but Maria, around. Maria yeah. had some yeah. some burning cross examination questions. Oh, well, you know, you said anybody on our list will get information about the ride and drives and other right. events. So, how do they get on your list? Uh, you can go to that's you can, a burning you can find us on, on Facebook okay. and Twitter <laughs> at uh, <laughs> at uh, Stitch Hawaii. Our website is www.stchawaii.org. Somebody had already taken stitch.org, so we had to get that oh, okay. one. Okay. <laughs> STC, and then you yep. spell out Hawaii. Okay. Right. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, going along with Jay's um, comment about how, you know, working on efficiency in your own home was kind of where Blue Planet got a lot of um, attention in the beginning, mm -hmm. and now you're taking on the bigger question of how we build our cities. Um, there's a lot of connection and communication and planning and visioning that that's going to go on there right and so we had mentioned the Hawaii Clean Energy Day on August 28th and um, go to that website and look at the list of speakers mm -hmm. and it's real it's not just the speakers because the folks who are contributing their ideas and participating in the discussions are the ones who are going to build this you know right. this, need uh, everybody this group mm -hmm. you know everybody. To, well, to I, feel, I feel that Sharon movement. is about to ask you a question. I'll, I'll just make a wild <laughs> guess as to what this might be. <laughs> because Sharon likes to ask this question. So you're talking about a very ambitious plan. Right. Right? And what, talking about remaking what are our the society. challenges you know, that face you? Do you think you might have any doing? challenges? <laughs> yeah. right. And what, how are you going to you know, really deal with the challenges? Because that, you know, we've been set talking about this for so long, right. you know, many, many years. And, and now we've got a little bit of traction. But how, what are the challenges to getting this? Well, there is a lot. Uh, the analogy I like to use is, is a hose. Uh, if you have a hose that's really it's like thrown in a pile in a garage, uh, there may be 10 or 15 different kinks in that hose. And so it's a, uh, kind of a process of identifying what those kinks are and, and uh, implementing, finding out the solutions to unkink those hoses. So, for example, every, with, with electric vehicles, for example, uh, there's an education uh, component. A lot of people don't know about electric vehicles. There's the technological uh, advancement of the, of the technologies, the reduction in cost of the batteries. That, that's moving in the right direction. Uh, there's some work to be done with the dealerships. In fact, one of the things we're working on right now is we're, we're creating a STITCH certified EV expert program where we're with EV experts. Uh, we've, had a lot of, we've heard a lot of uh, uh, consumers that have gone into dealerships and, and they'd had salespeople that didn't know anything about the EVs and actually actively <laughs> diverted them away from them. Um, there's, there's a, a <laughs> fundamental need for a, a lot more public charging and for the kind of charging that is going to be well utilized. So there's a, and, and that's just EVs. So the, every, every segment of clean transportation has its own kinks, bicycles, transit, 
and, and it's a process of identifying those, uh, looking for opportunities, whether it's legislatively or working with dealerships uh, through an education program. Um, there, there's a lot of challenges, and, and, uh, and we kind of tackle them as we, as we uh, are able to. Well, yes, you and your staff of 200 or so, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, move right out with this program. But you know, what, what are your initial steps? You know, even a, a multifaceted program has to start with moving your left foot forward. Right. So what, what's the left foot forward here? So for the last couple of years, our, our primary legislative um, uh, goal has, to, has been to get 100% uh, clean ground transportation target in place legislatively. Uh, we got real close this last year and made it to the second or third lap to final day in conference committee before mm -hmm. um, dying. Uh, we don't necessarily need, think we need a mandate. What we need is, is kind of a large target that helps people kind of um, envision the world that we're going towards and then it makes it easier to identify some of the barriers and specific policies that, policies that can help implement it. Uh, if, if people don't realize that by 2045 or 2050 all the cars will be EVs, then it's really hard to get, for example, condominiums to think about, oh, actually we need to install charging, right? So that's why we think that high-level vision is really important for helping to get implementing policies uh, enacted. Mm -hmm. So that has been kind of our primary focus the last few years. Uh, it'll be, again, this next legislative session. Uh, and then, but we also have a lot of implementing things. And one major thing that we've been working on, we just completed a big EVSC compliance study. Uh, EVSC is the charging infrastructure. So as you may know, there's a state law that all parking lots with over 100 public parking stalls are required to have at least one charging station. So we have a really good database of all the charging stations statewide, but we didn't know where the, par we don't, the parking situation. So we spent about six months gathering all the data on all the parking structures throughout the state. What did you find? Uh, we found compliance is low. It's <laughs> about 24% no uh, statewide. Mm -hmm. but. Mm. Considering that there's never been any monitoring, uh, that's not too bad. Uh, we also found that uh, the kind of charging we're getting is maybe not the most useful. We're getting a lot of uh, locations with one or two charging stations. Uh, and so in a neighborhood, you might have 10 or 15, but they're all in <coughs> small denominations. So if you're a, it, it, particularly in Honolulu, it's creating this whole group of uh, charger chasers that are constantly driving around trying to find a place to charge. Uh, whereas if they were all in one place, it would be a lot, a lot easier to yeah. find charging. Well, how about the guys that pull into the charging station and leave the car there all day? Well, luckily we're seeing a little bit less of that. There is kind of a self-policing that, that goes on, but it is a problem. I think a, even a bigger problem fundamentally is that a lot of the charging that we do have is, is free. And uh, it may sound kind of interesting that, that to say that's a problem, but actually what it's doing is if it's free, even those people who can charge at home, if it's open, they're going to take it. So the people who maybe can't charge at home, who live in apartments or condominiums where they can't charge, who really need the public charging to be able to feel comfortable owning an EV, are being kind of squeezed out. Okay, uh, <coughs> last question from me, then these guys will take over for you. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, from time to time I think about getting an electric car. Right. And right now I'm still driving my old Toyota fossil car truck, okay. which is very efficient, <laughs> very, very like efficient. <laughs> and I love it very much. It's a, you know, sort of a technological miracle, you know. <laughs> <laughs> How, what are you gonna do to make me, you know, buy an electric car? And by the way, I'm not particularly overcome by the existing credits, including the rebate that Peter Rossek told us about last week. You right. know, the one from uh, Nissan, yeah? Right. Um, what are you going to make? What are you going to do to change my mind? And I am just not me. I am another right. half a million me's who right. really should be changing our mind. Well, it's a good question you ask. Um, I, we found the number one uh, biggest thing that you can do to get somebody to want to purchase an EV is get them in an EV. When, once you drive it and you feel the the See, acceleration and the, an EV. the smoothness <laughs> and the quietness, it, it actually is a much better car. Uh, so I, and it. There is like a, a barrier of, of inexperience that once you cross that threshold, uh, it So the it best incentive is, to, is, is proximate, is yep. get close to it, Absolutely. expose people, let them drive it, let right. them drive with somebody who has one, <laughs> and all that, yeah. Right. What okay, about so cost? We're, we're There's cost, too. There's yep. cost, too, Absolutely. right? we got to get uh, the cost down. I guess the first thing I'd like to ask is, uh, is Maria, well, first thing is Sharon, can you summarize this discussion? <laughs> because that's your, that's your duty as a co-host of the program. 
I think I think it's wonderful that Stitch is around, that they're starting to bring people together because um, it's it's on all fronts. Uh, if we're looking at 100% ground transportation, I know you're trying to get the legislation through, but if you start bringing the people together that they begin the groundswell, I think it's easier to then pass legislation right. for the 100%. So thank you for pulling that together, Jim. Is it okay? Too. Keep and up the good work <laughs> and meet the challenges. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Maria, you know, you're the, the progenitor for this program for the month of August for transportation. Uh, you know, can you put this in perspective for us about other programs we have had or will have about transportation? Well, I really, well, I think that um, Shem made a really good point about how broad the issue is. You know, it's everything from your land use planning and your transportation systems to your vehicles and your fuel choices and the individuals who have to make those choices. By the way, Jay's got a truck. Anybody need to move anywhere? <laughs> Sorry, you said what would it Thank take? You, uh, <laughs> you don't think I get any yeah. requests? Yeah. <laughs> you get lots just of kidding, requests. You might change. Just kidding. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's it's excellent to have um, that broader view as well as specific um, tasks in each of those areas to um, to accomplish this goal. So I think it's a, a great start, and we've got a lot to do, but we've also come a long way. Even with the Honolulu Clean Cities. You know, I guess you were getting, folks thought you were a cleaning company or something <laughs> like that, right? <laughs> you know, so to be Sustainable Educate. Transportation Coalition of Hawaii, you know, I think that's moving in the right direction. Moving in yeah. the right direction. Oh, moving forward. Moving forward. Yeah. Oh, and next moving week, Hawaii next, next yeah. week, we're going to have Gary Andrashak uh, with IBI, which is, he's, he's calling it uh, Intelligence, Buildings, and Infrastructure. And they're, they're looking at rail, but rail looking at it in terms of it being a transportation mode, but also looking at communities and smart growth and you know how do you bring communities together so it's better planned, so you don't have to drive. You know? so, um, so it'll be and Gary was a very good speaker at the uh, Salvage the Rail program in the State Capitol Auditorium mm -hmm. two weeks ago. Um, okay, well, Shem, uh, I, you know, really appreciate what you're doing. It's very ambitious. And uh, it's not going to end right away. Uh, it's, it's, you're going to think of new things to do. Right. It takes le at least 12 months to wrap this up. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to evolve. It's going to be dynamic. It's going to be changed. You're going to grow. You're going to, you're going to see. You're going to, you're going to comport with the changes in the city. It'll be really interesting to watch because it involves so many disciplines coming together. And that means I hope you come back and talk to us about yeah. it. We'd like to be your partner in discussing this and rolling it out. We think it's really important. Right. Yeah. Good. Get that man's good. number. <laughs> <laughs> we Thank got it. Sharon. We got it. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Maria. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Aloha. Aloha, you guys. Thank you.